Welcome to Eat, Drink, Think. I'm Amy O'Neill Hauk. In this podcast from Edible Communities, a network of magazines published in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, we celebrate all things local and sustainable in the food world. This episode is brought to you by American Farmland Trust, a national nonprofit working to protect agricultural land, promote environmentally sound farming practices, and keep farmers and ranchers on the land. Learn more and get your No Farms, No Food bumper sticker at farmland.org. Today, we're speaking with Tamar Haspel. Tamar writes the James Beard award-winning Washington Post column, Unearthed, which looks at how our diet affects us and our planet. She's also written for Discover, Box, Slate, Fortune, Eater, and Edible Cape Cod. She co-hosts with journalist Mike Grunwald, the Climavores podcast. Their fast-paced and fact-based conversations take a look at the climate crisis through the lens of what we eat. And they offer up a pretty generous serving of chat about the technological advances in the food system. Tamar's book, To Boldly Grow, released just last year, is about an adventure in what she calls first-hand food. It's what happened when she and her spouse, Kevin, decided to eat something every day that they would grow, fish, hunt, or forage. Tamar deftly finds the humor in being a beginner, and her story is both entertaining and inspiring. Spoiler alert, learning how to eat first-hand food doesn't make you a loner. It connects you to a community of engaged, self-reliant eaters. Tamar, welcome to Eat, Drink, Think. Amy, thank you so much for having me. And I'm kind of glad you did the whole spoiler alert about food and community, because I think it's kind of what I and my work here have in common with edible communities. Yes, absolutely. Okay, well, early last year, I was sent an advanced reading copy of your book. And so I've been looking forward to our chat for a while now. And I have to say, I'm kind of excited that it took a little while because now we have your podcast, Climavores, to talk about too. But first, to boldly grow, can you talk a little bit about that leap into firsthand food? It was a leap. In fact, it was kind of a lifestyle U-turn. So I lived on the Upper West Side of Manhattan and I wrote about food for a living. And I was real comfortable doing that because you could do it from the you know safety and comfort of your armchair. And I was interested in the world, but I didn't actually participate in that except as an observer. And then I, I married Kevin, who is a doer. And to be fair, I knew that going in, but you, know, you marry a doer at your peril because you never know exactly what he's going to want to do. And our first project together was a vegetable garden on the roof of our building in Manhattan. And it was kind of revelatory because it was so interesting to do. And so I know your opportunities for growing food in Alaska are probably limited. But can you grow tomatoes, your own tomatoes, those little cherry tomatoes? Maybe in a greenhouse. Okay, maybe in a greenhouse. But lots of people, I think their first brush with growing their own food is those little cherry tomatoes. And the first one you eat and it still has that new tomato smell (laughs) and you stand in your garden and you're prepared to swear that it's the best tomato the world has ever seen. So that was sort of the backdrop. And then we ended up for various reasons, almost by accident, moving to Cape Cod and we had all of these options that we didn't have in Manhattan. And I had sort of gotten the bug from that rooftop garden. And so I remember the day. It was January 1st, 2009. And here I am. I'm a food writer. I'm transplanted to Cape Cod. I'm looking for a project, something I can write about, something I can sort of hang my hat on. And I say to Kevin, hey, do you think for the whole year, every day we can eat something that we get firsthand, that we grow or gather or hunt? And Kevin is like, universally supportive of my work. And he has a can-do attitude. And he goes, not a chance. (laughs) And I'm like, wait, who are you? And what have you done with Kevin? And he had a point. What are we going to eat all winter? Because it was January. But we had a few options. We still refer to this as our winter of shellfish because that's- You that's wanted to start that day. You weren't Oh, like- I did. We did start that day. No. And right, he said, right. oh, we can spend a year preparing and do it next year. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I want to do it now. And so we kicked it off. And you know, we started with the garden first thing and we got chickens in the spring. And that year we started fishing and then later on we just expanded and expanded and expanded. And if you had told me on January 1st, 2009, this is going to end up with you, you know, shooting 
and field dressing and breaking down a deer, I would have told you you were out of your mind because I am not a big fan of guns. But that's where it led. And it led sort of little by little and little by little doing these things built confidence and competence. And after a while, I could do hard things. It was kind of crazy. That's really cool. I think you are kind of an adventurous person, even maybe from your armchair though, because, you know, you were the kind of person who uh, somebody calls you from the freeway and said, uh, oh, here's yeah. some beautiful roadkill. And you said, yeah, bring it home. And that's like a very Alaskan thing to do, by the way. Oh, good. So- <laughs> we can bond over roadkill. <laughs> So yeah, and that was before Cape Cod, right? Yes, that was before Cape Cod. And and uh, uh, Kevin had, we lived on the Upper West Side and, Ke- and Kevin had was coming home from Connecticut and he saw a car hit a turkey, a wild turkey on the, uh, on the on-ramp to the Merritt Parkway. And so he pulled over and the turkey was dead and he called me and he said, I, I just saw a car hit a turkey. You want it? And I'm like, yeah, I totally want it. But of course, neither of us knew what to do with a, a turkey. I had never dealt with wild game. I've never dealt with, you know, an entire animal. And I figured we had 45 minutes to figure it out when he was driving home. And so, you know, you Google it and you, you, I, I actually, I asked my mother cause you know, she spent some time on a farm when she was a kid, her great uncle Frank's farm. And, and, and my mother said, why don't you try the internet? dear. <laughs> and so, but then it was funny because, okay, Kevin pulls up in front of our building on West End Avenue and he, he, he opens the, the, the trunk of the sob and he, he pulls this wild turkey out of, of the trunk. Now, if you have spent any time in New York, you know that New Yorkers do not bat an eye about things that happen in their city. My father tells a story of like a guy in a gorilla suit in a briefcase walking out of a building on third Avenue and nobody even looked, but they actually did look at Kevin pulling this bird out of the trunk. And we were meeting some friends downtown for dinner and we realized we weren't going to get this done. And so we stowed the the bird in a plastic bag in the courtyard of the building. And it was like, it was probably 40 degrees outside. So it was, it was cold enough to be able to do that. <laughs> and I said to the doorman, Jay, I put a dead wild turkey in a plastic bag in, in the courtyard. Make sure nobody takes it. And Jay goes, Okay. <laughs> he totally deadpanned it. <laughs> and so So what way makes you say yes to something like that? Is uh, it like is it about the food? Is it, it about adventure? Oh, that's a great question. And I never actually thought of it that way. And I would say it's a little bit of both. And it's it's this combination of okay, I I love to eat, I like to cook. Here's a food I've never eaten. I had never had wild turkey before. And um, and I've never dealt with an animal. And even then, and this was back when we lived in New York, even then I had the sense that if you eat animals, you should be cognizant that they're animals. You should know that they were living once and they have to die in order for you to eat them. And, you know, in New York, I didn't have much chance to do livestock. And we did do that once we moved to Cape Cod. But I guess that was the little nascent bubble of an idea about that that happened in Mm -hmm. New York. Mm -hmm. So by the time you published the book last year, you'd been living on Cape Cod and eating firsthand food for a decade or so, right? Can you, is there anything you want to update? Was there anything markedly different from when you started? Well, when we started, we tried, we tried everything. We tried to do, you know, the only thing I haven't done is ruminants because we don't have any grass. So, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. no sheep, no goats, no cows. No butter. (gasps) No butter. No butter. (laughs) But we, we, we ended up, we did, um, we did laying hens. We did meat chickens. We did ducks. We did turkeys. Um, we did pigs. Uh, we have fished for everything that swims and shellfished for everything that bivalves. And we have hunted. My bird hunting career consisted of one duck when I just decided sea ducks are not worth the effort. And 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 but then it went on to to venison. And I've 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 freezered a number of deer since then. Um, and oh, the things that we loved are still in our rotation. We still have a garden. We still have uh, chickens, laying hens. We, we don't do livestock so much anymore because we're not on Cape Cod all the time. Um, 
I, you know, I still fret about my poor fig tree, uh, which I love <laughs> and I try to keep alive every year. Um, we, I still mushroom hunt. Um, not only do we still fish, we just, you know, we, <laughs> like all, all fishermen, we, <laughs> we needed a bigger boat. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, we still do um, almost everything that we did in the book because it, it kind of, it kind of captured us. It, it ended up being way more compelling than I ever thought it would be. And the book is not just a straight up memoir. You've added some helpful and funny helpful advice hints. along the way. My favorite might be the flow chart on how to eat wild mushrooms and not die. <laughs> yeah. so how did you decide to incorporate advice along with your story? It's so funny because I just had a conversation with Meathead Goldwyn about this. Now, Meathead Goldwyn is uh, the, a barbecue guy. He has uh, he wrote a definitive barbecue book. His his website, AmazingRibs.com, is, is the go-to thing. And he's writing another book, and he asked me to read parts of it. And in his book, he totally tells you, do not forage for mushrooms. <laughs> and people don't like to, and I get why. I mean, the, the upside is a tasty soup, and the downside is an excruciating death. <laughs> and so, you know, you do the risk reward and it doesn't seem like, uh, but here's the thing about mushrooms. All the ones that'll kill you are tall, skinny, gilled mushrooms. So if you don't eat skinny, gilled mushrooms, you're pretty safe. And there are a bunch of mushrooms that don't have any deadly lookalikes. And, you know, they have a couple of lookalikes. You know, the worst you can have is a basically a stomach ache, but they're easy to identify. So, you know, I eat chanterelles and black trumpets and a bunch of different kinds of boletes and oyster mushrooms, um, hen of the wood, and there are a couple of others that you're just not going to make a mistake doing. Maybe we should make the caveat unless you have a mushroom sensitivity or allergy. Oh, oh, yes, of course. <laughs> unless, obviously, if you're allergic to mushrooms, this is a terrible pa pastime for you. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, and I, you have to be careful. There's no question about it. But I think that most people who get seriously ill or die from mushrooms are people who think they know what they're doing and they can differentiate among the different skinny gilled mushrooms and tell the delicious mm -hmm. ones from the non-delicious, from the, from the poisonous ones. And I know that I can't, I'm not going there. I'm not, I'm not taking that risk. I'm not trying it. And so, you know, we have, we have mushroom hunted for years with no ill effects and, uh, and oh yeah, morels on that list too. And uh, and I think that it's pretty straightforward that you, that there's a handful of mushrooms you can learn to identify in your area that are safe. But yeah, look carefully in the guidebooks um, and oh, definitely go through the flow chart. There are old mushroom hunters and there are bold, bold mushroom, mushroom hunters <laughs> and there are no old, bold mushroom hunters. So yeah, don't be a bold <laughs> mushroom hunter. Be a chicken shit <laughs> mushroom hunter. That is the way to do it. Right. Okay. Somewhere along the way, as you were building all of your food harvesting skills, you became not just firsthand food eaters, but food producers. You and Kevin started an oyster farm. Yes. I'm curious about how that shift to feeding others has informed your thinking, informed your thinking about the food system. A lot. In fact, I think that um, since I read one of the things I read about is agriculture, having a working farm gives me a, a, a a genuine window into how working farms work and what farmers are concerned about. And, you know, growing oysters in Barnstable Harbor off of Cape Cod is in lots and lots of ways very different from growing corn and soy in, you know, the, the flatlands of Iowa. But there are some similarities that you just cannot escape. The extent to which you are uh, at the whim of uh, at the mercy of 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 weather um, and disease, and I know what it's like to lose your entire crop to disease, and even after the fact, not be a hundred percent sure how it happened or how to avoid it in in the future. And you know, when you think about it, oysters, we're just starting to do the kind of husbandry and research that they've been doing on you know corn for a hundred years. And so there's still lots of mysterious stuff and and with oysters. And 
you're trying to basically figure out a how to keep these things alive and b how to move heavy things from place to place efficiently which is i mean farming was just like farming rocks you just move heavy things all the time and so mm-hmm. it's it's this combination of of logistics and zoology <laughs> to to and and it, it's been fascinating but it's also been extremely rewarding mm-hmm. and the fact that we happen to live in a place that Kevin, my husband, calls it the Napa Valley of oysters because the conditions are just perfect for growing oysters. Mm. And we don't take the credit for that. We just got lucky. Um, and and to be able to, to raise this delicious thing that people love and know that, you know, there are people who are eating these things and enjoying them in restaurants all around the country is incredibly satisfying. At the same time, I don't kid myself that, you know, we're feeding the world because oysters are luxury products for rich people. And so this is a very specific niche in the food system. Um, but I think it's it's given me a sort of some, you know, some ideas about that, too. There's nothing like farming to teach you about farming. Oysters didn't used to be, right? I mean, isn't it true that in New York, for instance, they were so abundant in wild that they were just eaten as an everyday food they product? Were. They, they were. They were for a long, long time. And, you know, Mark Kolansky wrote the book about that. And uh, uh, yes, they were. And there were huge reefs. But for anybody trying to recreate that, I got to tell you, those days are gone and they're not coming mm-hmm. back because mm-hmm. there, there are diseases now that kill oysters Usually their maximum lifespan is five years, maybe. Mm -hmm. And so that's what making, that's one of the things, that's one of the many things that makes reestablishing reefs that are self-sustaining much more difficult now. And, and there are lots of interesting projects doing stuff like that, the Billion Oyster Project in New York and, and some other ones. And there are places where reefs are being established um, to, to, to clean water, um, to mitigate erosion. There are a couple of, of great things that reefs do, um, but it's it it's not easy. There, there are mm-hmm. a lot of things working against you. Oysters are in this interesting gray area uh, as far as food categories are concerned. I know, you know, a vegan Alicia Kennedy eats oysters. She considers them not to mm-hmm. be animals in the same sense. So uh, can when you talked about animal husbandry, as far as taking care of them, do you have, how do you reflect on that kind of middle ground. Yeah. I don't consider oysters to be sentient. Um, and you know, people disagree about this. Um, and I think that I think I've met other vegans who make an exception for oysters and I've met vegans who don't make an exception for oysters. Um, and I think it is a a hundred percent personal choice. I think from an ethical perspective, oysters are one of the best foods you can choose for a number of reasons. First of all, I don't think that, that, they are sentient to the to the extent that certainly that you know chickens and pigs are, and I don't think pain has to factor into this. Um, and oysters are different from most other farmed foods in that they actually leave the environment better than they found it because they're filter feeders, and so they they filter out some of the algae, and by doing that, they 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 are responsible for nutrient removal in. Uh, estuaries, which are often overloaded with nutrient with nutrients that cause uh, algae blooms, that cause fish kills, and oysters can prevent that. There's a very dramatic uh, um, demonstration that I, I guess a number of people do, where they have two algae filled tanks side by side, and they put a bunch of oysters in one, and then they like give a talk for an hour or so, and then the water's all clean. And one oyster can filter almost 50 gallons of water in a day. So if you think about the millions and millions of oysters that were growing in a place like Barnstable Harbor or like on Cape Cod, the estuaries on the south side, um, it can make a meaningful difference. Are you are people in your oyster neighborhood doing kelp side by side with oysters? Um, we've talked about kelp where we are. Um, kelp is, it, 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 in some ways, it's great to do with oysters because they're countercyclical. So you grow oysters in the summer and you go grow kelp in the winter. Um, and I, I think that some people are experimenting with it. It's the, so far, Cape Cod is not a big a kelp producer. One thing I've gotten a sense for after spending some time with your writing and your podcast is how you approach some of society's thornier problems, Dana 
is your friend, right? When you're looking for answers, for instance, about which is better for the climate, food that traveled or food that didn't, right. you lean on data. So I'm wondering, in your own day-to-day eating, does your research influence you? And if so, how? Yeah, it totally does. And, uh, you know, it, it, the, the local thing comes up over and over and over again, especially in, the, in a context like this. I'm sure readers out here are, are big fans of local food, and I am a big fan of local food. I produce some local food. I consume local food. I go out of my way to eat local food because I think there are a whole lot of advantages to having farms in communities. I think that it's great to have a place where a kid can meet a pig. It's great to have a place where people can go and see how food grows because, you know, that's something that you get removed from if there's no farm in your area. I think farmers markets can become community touchstones. Um, and I think that these these farms can contribute to local economies. I am in favor of local agriculture. But the thing about food is that it's all trade-offs all the time. And there's no one kind of food or, or method of raising food that is, uh, is better in every way. Almost everything is better than some ways and worse in some other ways. And those are all the ways that local is terrific, but it's not better for the climate because the thing that's best for the climate is if you can grow things efficiently at scale. And transportation is only about 5% of the greenhouse gas over, you know, uh, uh, cost of, of food. And so that difference is easily trumped by differences in efficiencies in growing in a small local farm versus a remote farm. And of course, there are other issues too about nutrient runoff and growing agriculture at scale. So it's a really complicated conversation. But, but, even though I write about climate all the time and data is my friend, I also recognize the trade-offs and that climate isn't the only thing. Data isn't the only thing. Um, people want to feel good about the things that they eat. But that said, I do use data when I'm talking about like, you know, choosing pork over beef, for example. Um, and it's be, it's the reason I am arguably Twitter's number one lentil evangelist, because I think everybody should be eating more legumes. And I try and incorporate, incorporate more into my diet. But the number one thing about food is it's got to taste good. And I never want that to fall by the wayside. Yeah. Well, in your podcast, you and co-host Mike hunt down food-focused solutions to climate problems. You're passionate about your hope that folks will set aside dogma and consider new ideas based on their merits and not what they already like or believe. I was curious if there's an idea that you two have investigated or floated on the podcast that maybe has captured folks' attention more than others. That's a good question. And unfortunately, the things that tend to capture people's attention are is when, you know, you rain on their parade. And so, you know, when we talk about local food not being better for the climate, when we talk about organic food not being better for the climate, those are the things that it's the things that get people's hackles up that gets their attention. But actually, one of the episodes that we did that I think got the most engagement was when we did vertical farms, because in my book, vertical Vertical farms are a complete loser because you get you you lose when you try and replace the energy of the sun with the energy of the grid to grow food, and uh, and and I think that did make some people think about vertical farming because you you know you look at it on paper hey, hey, look we can grow vegetables we can go well you can fruit fruit baby greens near cities we don't need a lot of water we don't need a lot of pesticides we don't need a lot of land and that all matters but it's just trumped by the fact that you have to suck it it, it growing food is a really energy intensive enterprise and i think that did open people's eyes mhm uh, it's one of those issues that is a little bit different in Alaska. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah. Oh, and I think that there will be places for it. And I would love to see cold places have, you know, big vertical farms maybe powered by their own little tiny nuclear they, reactor. <laughs> they still have to solve the energy problem. Yeah, they have Absolutely. to solve the energy problem. It's huge, huge. And I admire how you encourage people to embrace complexity of thinking. Actually, you acknowledge the harms that are caused by industrial agriculture, but you emphasize that problems like yield can't be ignored when seeking climate solutions. Have you noticed 
shifts in how your readers respond to issues that are more collect, I more complex? Do I do because I think climate has changed some people's views about technological solutions. And, you know, I can remember <laughs> when the three most incendiary letters in food were GMO. <laughs> and and it was, oh my God, it was it was just this these these counterproductive arguments about this stuff because of course the GMO in question was Roundup Ready Corn and Soy. But now scientists, public sector scientists are using gene editing technology to do really interesting things, to create more nutrient-dense crops, to create drought-resistant crops, um, to create faster-growing crops, more efficient crops. They're jiggering photosynthesis around so that more of the plants, the, the plant can use sunlight more efficiently. Um, and all of this is kind of awesome. And, you know, when you look in the, the, the plant-based and, and cultivated meat spheres, I think there's still a lot of reluctance in a lot of quarters. But I think that because people see climate as a real emergency, um, it sort of makes people a little more willing to consider the risks, and there are always risks, of untried solutions. Part of that hesitation about GMO, maybe not from a public sector, but from maybe an agriculture, a small agriculture sector, might come from the um, seed sovereignty kind of sure. frame of mind. Sure. So w with that newer, with these newer advances, are people going to be able to save seeds and, and you know, ha have ownership over what they choose to grow? Or are they going to be tethered to, you know, this new technology and that yeah. When when food is grown at scale, most of the time, it was certainly in this country, um, people don't save seeds. And it, occasionally it happens with soybeans. It never happens with corn because corn is hybrid. Um, and growing, uh, growing a crop for seed is a different enterprise from growing a crop for food. And so usually we have people who are specializing in growing the crop for seed or growing it for food. Now, on smaller farms, it's a completely different kettle of fish. And fortunately, we still have all kinds of availability. We have seed banks. I was at the seed bank at, at CIMIT, the Center for uh, Improvement in uh, uh, Wheat and Maize in Mexico City. And they have a seed bank because, of course, there are lots of indigenous groups in Mexico who grow their own land-raised kinds of corn, and that's the exception to hybrid corn. Um, and they are very carefully preserving these, and they're, they're not the only ones. And I think alongside this effort to grow food and increase yields, we have this other effort to make sure that we save these things, not just for food sovereignty, but because these plants, these different varieties, Varieties have traits that me, we might want to mine and incorporate into other kinds of varieties. And you never know what you're going to find. It's absolutely critical that we hold on to those for both of those reasons. Mm -hmm. Okay. You already brought up the local food episode of the Climavores podcast, and it's one that got my attention, of course, especially given the subject of your book. It sets out to debunk the idea that local food has a quantitative advantage over food that's traveled. And yet you just can't quit local food, Tamar. You I jokingly to say quit. to Mike, no, <laughs> you say, I, I believe this is the first time in my entire career of writing about food that I've been accused of romanticizing. <laughs> well, I, that's that's I Mike pressed, for you. <laughs> yeah. And I press pause right there because I think you had shined a light on why thinking of big systems is so hard for people when it comes to eating. Food is romance. It's sensual. We eat with our eyes, nose, fingers, and taste buds. And it's kind of a tough thing to be clinical and scientific about. What do you think? I think you can have both. I think you can have it all. I think that, you you know, I, I the column that is going to run... Um, I think in next week is about foods that are climate friendly and also delicious. And, and I think that that's so important. And I don't think that we, uh, okay. It's not right to say, I don't think you have to sacrifice to eat a, you know, a climate friendly diet or substitute healthful diet or because 
That's bullshit because, of course, it, it's going to mean that you have to decide not to eat some things that you like. But that doesn't mean you have to decide to eat things you don't like. And I don't ever want anybody to do that. You should never eat anything you don't like. And, and I think we have to, you know, experiment a little, dig a little, um, lean in to the foods you happen to like that are climate friendly. Like I, I am constantly surprised at the internet bandwagon for potatoes. Whenever you mention them, people are like, though, because of course the nutrition community is constantly poo-pooing them. And I've been defending them for years and years now. And then potato lovers come out of the woodwork. Okay, well, potatoes are an extremely climate-friendly food. And so, and I don't want anybody to give up, um, you know, their food traditions. I don't want to give up, you know, I don't want to give up mine. I don't want you to give up yours. I don't want people to give up on the idea that what we, we want to eat delicious things. That all matters. Um, but, you know, it's like everything else. Being responsible means, like, you can't sleep till noon and not go to work. It's like, yeah, life asks from us that that we we travel through the world treating people well um taking responsibility for our actions uh thinking about how what we do affects other people and you know food is no exception but i i don't want it to be grim and horrible mhm mm mhm mm and speaking of our senses, uh, when it comes to food in To Boldly Grow, you write about some citizen science that you did with your friends, a blind, literally you blindfolded your friends, yeah. taste test comparing the flavor of commercial eggs with your own backyard chicken's eggs. And with apologies for giving anything away, the tasters could not identify the backyard eggs via flavor alone. Now, I'm sure this was really fun, but I wonder if you find any bigger meaning with respect to our industrialized food system. Amy, I have never gotten the kind of hate mail I got from that piece. And so we did the test. I wrote it up. I wrote about it in the Washington Post. And I have to say that I also talked to a poultry scientist and they've known this forever. As long as you can't see the color of the eggs, because they can look different when eggs, when chickens have different kinds of feed, people cannot tell the difference between eggs. And they can't tell the difference between white eggs and brown eggs. But if they can see a white egg or a brown egg, they'll say whichever one they grew up with, that's the one that tastes better. And and, and be, uh, uh, so controversial, <laughs> got picked up everywhere. And I got, Tamar, you ignorant slut, my chicken eggs uh, taste better. I, your taste buds must have been shot off in the war. Um, and and uh, uh, people just insisted that they could tell that their eggs were different. And so the, the world of egg eaters breaks down into two categories. There are people who have not done blind taste tests and they think eggs from backyard chickens taste better. And there are people who have done blind taste tests. And it's not just me. It's also Kenji Lopez-Alt and all those poultry scientists. And they don't think that they taste different because they've actually done the test. And, and, but this raised exactly the question that you're getting at. Okay. Because when you do that, it sounds like you're defending the industrial system. And I've had chickens in my backyard for 15 years who will tell you that I'm not defending the industrial system. But I, again, it, it sort of goes back to this whole idea of like when we were talking about local food, that if you think a food is better, you think it's, a, it's better in every single way. And it's not better in every single way. So backyard eggs are better in the very important way that the hens who lay them have decent lives. But if you start telling people that, oh, and they taste better, and then somebody goes to the grocery store and shells out $7 for a dozen of these eggs. And, and then they taste it and it, they just taste like eggs to them. They're going to say, hey, these people who are telling me to eat this food, they're, they're blowing smoke. I'm not listening to these people. I think we have to be rigorous about these things if we aim to persuade. So there's a lot of great reasons not to eat 
chickens that are raised in a confined operation that have nothing to do with flavor, and that's enough to make a decision. Is that what you're saying? Uh, well, certainly egg egg uh, egg laying hens, because mm-hmm. I think of all the confined animals, they have the worst lives. Now, I think it's possible to raise animals, at least some animals, in a perfectly appropriate confinement system. I think if you have a barn that is not overcrowded and has an enriched environment, that's a perfectly reasonable place to raise chickens. Um, Or even pigs, as long as they have plenty of space and they have deep litter and they can engage in piggy behaviors. I don't think confinement is in and of itself, you know, a deal breaker for a humane system. But I think an unenriched, overcrowded environment, and certainly, I mean, most egg-laying hens in this country are in are in very small battery cages. And I think keeping a hen in a cage that's you know gives her a, a area the size of a sheet of paper um, for her whole life is not acceptable. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of exploring going on on how to safely, humanely keep chickens away from you know, the avian flu right, right now. Mm-hmm. So how can how can we have pasture-raised birds that are not going to get sick? Right. And, you know, the f- biosecurity is a huge problem. And I think, you know, humane confinement could help a lot. And, you know, I, I have you ever raised meat chickens? No. I, I've raised meat chickens. And they... A part of the problem, of course, with meat chickens is that they've they've been raised to grow so fast that they can't support their weight, and they they sit around like lumps in their own poop. It's it's they're they're just not appealing birds. Um, but uh, my my uh, laying hens used to run free until foxes moved into the neighborhood, and now we do keep them in their run, which is eight by sixteen for eight birds with a, a coop up above. Um, and by, from what I can tell, they're just fine in there. And as long as they have enough space, they have things to play with, they have things, good things to eat. Um, and, uh, and so, no, I don't think that, that confinement is, as I said, a, a deal breaker for a humane system. Uh, back to your local food episode of climate, um, Climavores, it got me wondering if eating local is kind of in a way, one degree away, maybe emotionally from firsthand food. We probably shouldn't call it secondhand food. It's It's so funny. I made that. (laughs) What should we call it? Secondhand food? No, that's no good. Well, yeah. So it's a short step from firsthand food in that in many cases, you know, your producer. Mm -hmm. And do you think that connection is nourishing in some way? Oh, I totally think it's nourishing. And, and, you know, I feel it Um, the same way other people do. I mean, I've been buying produce. There's a place on Cape Cod. Unfortunately, they stopped selling retail with COVID, but uh, called Crow Farm. And I've been going there since I was a little kid and my family had spent summer vacations on Cape Cod. And, and I love the fact that I can eat their apples and their peaches and their corn. Um, and I go out of my way to buy it because these are, this is a family that I've known my whole life. And I think it is nourishing, that said, I think there are a lot of scammers out there who are like trying to play on that. And, you know, some of the best farms I've ever seen are these small local farms. But by the same token, the single worst farm I've ever seen was a small local farm. And and so, um, you know, it's there's a little bit of buyer beware here because most of the time you don't know how your farmer is growing food. And we've taken people out on our oyster farm and I see from the from the from the other half, from being on the other side of the table, people who go to our farm and we take an oyster out of the tray and we open it for them on the farm and we give it to them are that is the oyster that they will never forget. This is an oyster that is indelible. And I feel a swell of pride at being able to provide that. But there are things about running my farm and how my husband and I do it that you can't know from buying our oysters or even from visiting our farms. But like I said, I I buy the value of the connection because I think it's important to not lose sight of number one, the fact that we have food because somebody's working really hard to create to to produce it. And number two, the things in general that are best for us are uh, foods 
in that are pretty close to the state of you know the their plants and animals of origin. Mm-hmm. Well, feeding ourselves is everyday work that won't go away. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, there's a lot of joy in it. But the seemingly intractable problems of the food system could get better. Can we take a second for a thought experiment? If we could imagine skipping ahead beyond all the work to get there, what does life look like 25 or 50 or more years in the future when we've found some solutions for the problems we're mired in now? That's a great question. So- I think one of the biggest issues, uh, well, let's talk about two big issues. Two big issues are meat and waste. And on the one hand, you know, down the road, here's what I would like to see. I would like to see a whole lot of meat replaced by plant-based meats, which have gotten so good that they're indistinguishable from the real thing, or cultivated meat, although I am, I am... I don't know if they're if that's going to be cheap enough any time. Or lentils? Oh, oh go, go get the lentils. <laughs> Hold your horses. <laughs> and um and I would like to see to the extent that we still have meat from actual animals, I think that those animals need decent lives and instant deaths and their meat should be expensive. Um on the waste side, I would love to see, this is sort of a one-two punch of habits and technology. I would love to see technology that extends food life. And, you know, I am a big fan of uh, uh, the uh, ultra pasteurization for that very reason. I know a lot of people are not, but I, I love the idea that I can get a dairy product and it can last for six weeks in my refrigerator or a month at least. Um, and I would also like to see people internalize the idea that wasting food is a really bad thing and we have to do better. So I think we have to do better institutionally. We have to do better in our, in the whole system, but so much of waste comes down to consumer habits. And I think we have to do better there too. So I hope that all of the people who are working on these, both from a policy standpoint and from a technology standpoint, um, uh, make a lot of headway in the next 50 years. And those two problems are minimized in that kind of time frame. Hmm. Thanks for considering that. It it makes me wonder if um, that high quality protein is only available to people with the privilege to pay for it. You know, what what do those of us who don't have that access eat? I don't think high quality protein has to be available only to the people who have the privilege to pay for it. If plant-based meat is indistinguishable, that means it's high quality protein. And there's no reason we can't create that in a plant-based uh, you know, a, a plant-based substitute. I also think we can get high quality protein from eggs and from chickens and from pigs that are well-raised and have them still be affordable. I mean, mm-hmm. I buy uh, pork from, you know, Nyman Ranch pork, uh, and it's only a couple of dollars more per pound than conventional pork, and it's cheaper than almost any beef. And uh, so I think we have to look at this in two ways. We have to look at it in the developed world and in the developing world. In the developed world, All of us, rich and poor, eat way too much meat for our our global diet to be good for the planet. And if we all ate half as much and paid twice as much for it and made up the difference in lentils, um, then we could solve that problem and nobody's budget would be the worst for it. And But when you're talking about the developing world, there are still places where people do not get enough protein. And that's a completely different problem. And we have to work on that also. Um, But one of the things that will help is those plant-based substitutes. And, uh, you know, I'm in favor of having some animal products in our uh, in our food supply. I think for a lot of reasons, especially in the developing world where, you know, cows aren't just meat, their transportation and labor. And uh, although I'd like to see those things phased out too, and have people have access to proper transportation and labor. Um, but, uh, but it, it's a very different question in places 
where protein is literally not accessible. In the United States, everybody can access it and accesses way too much of it. What do you think the role of the eater, the individual consumer is when it comes to the climate? It's, it's, that's a tough one because here's the thing. When we talk about energy, um, it's like we know what we have to do, right? We have to electrify everything and then try and power the grid with non-carbon sources. And so there's the plan. Okay, getting from here to there, that's going to be tough, And but we're making great strides on it. And basically, we have the blueprint laid out. But food is much more difficult because we don't even know what the plan is. Okay, you want to eat better for the climate? Eat less meat. Uh, waste less food. But how do you get people to do that? How do you get people to want to do that? It's very difficult. And energy choices are often made at the state or at least the institutional level, whereas food decisions are generally made at the individual level. So you can have sort of a push solution with energy, but food is a pull system because farmers will only grow what people will buy. Manufacturers will only make what people will eat. And so the consumer is the person who is driving all of this. Now, you can make arguments about policy changes, policy levers that could change those, mostly in the forms of making some foods more expensive and some foods less expensive. But demand for food is pretty inelastic, and people will continue to eat the things that they like with small changes in prices. So it's going to take big changes in prices, and those things are going to be really hard to implement. And so I don't pretend to have an answer to this because it's a very thorny problem. But I think when we talk about, is it an institutional, is this an institutional responsibility or an individual responsibility? The answer is different in food than it is in some of the other pressing issues that we're talking about uh, with regard to climate. Well, with respect to waste, the individual food waste is doesn't really compare to the waste on the industrial side, right? Oh, it does. In the United States, almost all of the way, I think uh, at least a third, 30 to 40 percent is at the, is at the household level. So yeah, and it, that's bigger than any other single component down the, down the line. So absolutely it is. Mm -hmm. So you say, Tamar, that the individual, that the market is driven by what the individual wants to eat. For the most part, yeah. Yeah. And I feel a little skepticism about that because- Because you think it's farm subsidies. Well, yeah, maybe, but we're also maybe getting played because like they're trying to sell us like potato chips that are incredibly delicious, but don't have any nutrition or, you know, things okay, like that. Well, you know, that's so a perfect example. Can I stop you and let's talk yeah, about that? Yeah, absolutely. Because that's exactly what they're trying to do. These food companies are trying to sell you things that are irresistibly delicious. They go out of their way to figure out how to make a food taste so good that you overeat it. I talk about this all the time. It's a huge problem. It's I think this is you know this is where we pin the blame for obesity. But we are not so much victims as co-conspirators because it is the thing that we want to eat. And so then you have this problem where okay, you have companies selling people things they want to eat. And in a free democratic society, how do you stop that from happening? Mm -hmm. Is it more effective as individuals, as Diane, um, Daniel Nirenberg said on the podcast, she says, vote with your vote, don't vote with your fork. Is it more effective? <laughs> I love when she says that. To, I love yeah. Daniel. I'm a huge fan. <laughs> Is it more effective to for us as individuals to try to influence institutions or government to ha have make sure that there's transparency as far as what what's going on with the food we're offered or, or is it more effective to just stop buying things that are you know really enticing and in, uh, incredibly hard to resist when i think both are important but when it comes to transparency there's nothing opaque about potato chips i mean <laughs> they they're like the ingredients are on the label we know people are trying to sell them to us because they want to make money there's 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 no secrets in potato chips 
And no, but there are areas of the country where there are food access issues where there are not alternatives necessarily. Except um, that when you bring supermarkets into those areas, nothing changes. Yeah, trust me on this one. I wrote about this a number of years ago. So back in maybe 2008, 2010, the idea that food deserts, places where people couldn't get, you know, decent, healthy, wholesome food, um, were causing people's bad diets, got a lot of currency. And because it got a lot of currency, and it makes sort of intuitive sense, because it got a lot of currency, um, it was studied extensively. And so when I took a look at this, you know, when I look at complex issues, there's always people on one side and then there's people on the other side and you have to try and figure out who makes more sense and, and what's really true. But it was, it was bone simple with food deserts because absolutely everybody who has ever studied this agrees that when you bring a full service supermarket into a food desert, nothing changes. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't bring supermarkets in because food access is necessary for a decent diet, but it is not sufficient. And it's not surprising that when you have crap diets that have been entrenched for probably by this time a couple of generations, that just putting a supermarket there isn't going to change anything. And so I don't think access is really as big an issue as other people do. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One of which is that if access were a problem and, and if affordability, for example, which is a part of access, were a problem, you would expect people like in, in the middle tier of, if you divide the country into socioeconomic thirds, so bottom, middle, top, you would expect people in the middle tier to eat better and to have less disease, to weigh less than people in the bottom tier, but that's not what happens. They're basically exactly the same. The middle tier actually does a little bit worse than the bottom tier. Now, the top tier does a little bit better. So, you know, last I looked, the bottom two tiers, obesity, which isn't the only issue here, but it's a decent proxy and it's easy to measure, um, was 40% in the bottom two tiers and 30% in the top tier. So people who have a lot of education and a lot of resources can do a little bit better than people in the bottom two tiers, but it's not access, it's not money, it's the potato chips. Okay, so I guess I'm not suggesting that people who have anybody in the world who has potato chips available won't want to eat them. But if it's a nobody, metaphor, if, Amy, it's a metaphor. No, but, but if you don't have access to anything else, you logistically cannot be purchasing right. any other Like I options. said, access is necessary, but not sufficient. Right. Right. So I guess that's kind of what I was getting at. And I, so that's, I guess it leaves the question open, you know, what, what is the answer if um, access is part of it? If access, you know, if we're giving, we do need to bring food to areas of the country that don't have it, um, you know, and, you know, individual choices aren't going to necessarily solve the problem and uh, governments aren't necessarily going to solve the problem. What what are you seeing? I, I mean, I know there's not a silver bullet, but I'm guessing what where are you thinking? What are you thinking these what, days? I, I'm thinking this? we should stop telling people bullshit about food is what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. And part of this comes from charlatans selling you know, out and out bullshit. But part of it comes from the well-meaning nutrition community. And I think that, um, you know, the whole field, and this has made me no friends and it's going to make me fewer the more I talk about it. I think the whole field of nutritional epidemiology, which is, you know, the, the study of populations and what they eat and what diseases they get, um, rather than doing controlled studies where you put somebody in a room and you feed them a certain thing and see what happens. I think that that has been responsible for two things. First of all, people believing stuff and then hearing, oh, no, that's not right. Um, you know, for a long time, people thought, oh, I shouldn't eat fat. And that's what the mainstream nutrition community said. And now the nutrition community is saying, oh, no, there are a lot of fats that are actually good. You should maybe not eat so many carbs. 
And we've had conflicting headlines about eggs, about meat, about saturated fat, about coffee, about alcohol, um, and a number of other foods. And so, first of all, people believe things about these foods that are wrong. But second, they believe that having a decent diet, you have to have a white coat and a PhD in you know nutrition. And they scientists have disabused people of the idea that ordinary humans can make easy decisions about eating for themselves and for their family and do just fine. I mean, we humans aid our way to planetary dominance with no expert intervention whatsoever. And over the last 50 years, we've had all of these experts who are heavily invested in the idea that expertise is necessary to make sense of food, telling people all kinds of stuff that is sometimes wrong, sometimes iffy, but always confusing. I think that it's liberating to think about that history, that hundreds of more years history of people eating without any advice at all. Millennia. Mm -hmm. Since the primordial ooze, we figured it out. And of course, you know, the current landscape makes it harder to figure out because until the last hundred years, all the foods we had available were just ordinary foods that, you know, people can eat. And we didn't have these problems so much. And our problem was scarcity. And that's a much more serious problem than abundance. And the good news is in most parts of the world, we've solved that problem. And I'm all in favor of that. But abundance has exacted a serious toll on us. Yeah. And so if the world is coming at us with what Marion Nestle would call highly processed food products yep. all the time, then how do we get there? How do we get to that genetic inherited knowledge of what to okay. eat? <laughs> Listen to me and only to me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But it's like, you know, it's so difficult because the people who are telling us what to eat and how to eat better, especially with regard to weight loss, are people who are either wittingly or unwittingly often appealing to the worst in us because we're all looking, and me included, I've been fat. I struggle with my weight my whole life. And we all want an easier way. And nobody wants to sort of just swallow the hard truth that there isn't an easier way. And so I think until we come to terms with the idea that feeding ourselves and our families is our own responsibility and we can execute it, most of us can. Obviously, some people just don't have the resources to be able to do it, and we need a social safety net for those people. But for most of us, we can feed ourselves, we can feed our families well, without breaking the bank, without, you know, mad skills. And we should just shut off the people in the white coats who are telling us how to eat. And most people, most of the time, know what they shouldn't eat. There was a, a book, oh, I'm going to forget her name. Her first name is Priya. And she was at Stanford and she wrote How the Other Half Eats. That's the name of the book. And she did this study where she interviewed parents, usually mothers, the parents who are in charge of feeding their children. And, you know, what stands between them and a decent diet for themselves and their children. And almost always the parents knew what junk was. They knew what they shouldn't be eating. But there were so many forces in their lives that sort of pointed them in direction of the thing that was convenient, that was affordable, that their kid wanted, that they made these decisions knowing that they weren't the most healthful decisions, but they checked a lot of other boxes in their life. And so I think people know what to eat. It's not rocket science. And I think people need to be empowered by the idea that, yeah, ordinary people can make these decisions without expert intervention. Thank you. Well, I, I I think we could probably, you and I, go on, on and on and on. If we're <laughs> ever on the same like a... coast at the same time, we're going to have to like <laughs> sit down and hash all of this through. Yeah, it seems like a great place to wind down the idea that we can trust ourselves and enjoy what we eat. Tamar, thank you so much for joining us. Amy, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. 
We've been listening to columnist, author, and co-host of the Climavore podcast, Tamar Haspel. Thank you for joining us today at Eat, Drink, Think. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to pick up your local Edible magazine. You can find show notes for today's episode at ediblecommunities.com.